My name is Evan Ashford, and I'm the program specialist of the Writing and Language Center at CAPS. So I oversee all the writing and language tutoring that takes place there, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have about uh, CAPS services and how to do that with students and courses. But um, I'm also a PhD candidate in the Department of Linguistics, I'm a former instructor in the Departments of English, where I taught first year composition from 2005 to 2008. And from 2008 to 2011, I taught uh, introductory linguistics courses here at UNM before I settled into my current role in overseeing uh, writing and language tutoring. So, okay, it's uh, projected in two screens. This is almost disorienting, but in a good way. In a good way. I really like this. I'm just not used to it. It's so different from you. So, all right, um, I guess before I start, we have a really small group here, and I always like to get to know my audience. So, uh, if you could just kind of tell me what's your name and, and what program are you from, what do you teach, and maybe kind of what brought you here. My name is Julie Redekop, and I'm in the PhD program, and I give um, Spanish classes. And they're, they're integrating more online components in the class, and we have office hours online sometimes, so I'm hoping that this will give me some more ideas on how to interact with the students. And I'm Rachel Spalding, and I'm also in the uh, PhD program in the Spanish and Portuguese department, and I'm teaching two um, 302 online courses this semester that is specifically about developing writing skills in Spanish, so. Uh, okay. That's good. Uh, thanks. And I'm Kat Castaldi, I'm the director of the language lab. I'm Leslie, I'm the supervisor of the language lab. And we have a cameraman whose face will go on scene. <laughs> oh, That's enough. Dom, yes. Oh, thanks, thanks for recording this. Our, our super student employee. I feel like a movie star So all right, um, just to kind of get us started thinking about this topic, I'm posing three questions up here that I'd like you to think about very briefly. Uh, whether you write them down or just reflect on them um, in a small group and then kind of as a bigger group we can talk about it. But first, what purpose does writing serve in your course or courses if you're teaching more than one? And second, in what ways do you currently respond to student writing? I'm assuming that if you're, say, getting uh, a typewritten hard copy of a paper, you're very likely to make written responses on that hard copy, uh, but maybe you do so through email or student conferences and just talking about the piece of writing. But also, you're here because I imagine you, you want to know something about responding to student writing, and so I'm curious about what you perceive as instructors of shortcomings in your ability to respond to student writing. I certainly have my own, and I'm just curious what uh, you all think about your own ability to respond to student writing. I'll just give you a couple minutes to uh, either write those thoughts down and just reflect. So all right, I'm just curious, what, uh, what does writing serve at, in your course? Is it sort of the focus of instruction, like you spend the whole semester looking at writing in Spanish? Or is it sort of the way through which your students demonstrate an understanding of content in that course? Well, for myself, it's several of those things. I mean, they're developing their writing, so they're starting at one point. So part of their writing demonstrates where they are, so it gives me a baseline to evaluate their progress through the course. It also allows them as ways to connect and talk to other people and also reveals like certain um, cues to their certain level of proficiency, whether they're native speakers, their spelling. Um, it also works the way I have the activity scheduled as allows them space to brainstorm, develop ideas, to work as steps to get to the next part in their writing. So 
the writing process is, in, is integral at every single step, whether it's you know formal evaluations or just the ways in which that they can foster community within the space. Brilliant. So you, you just get the nail on the head. It really is a multifunctional thing that students are doing. Mm -hmm. What about you? My course is an intermediary, intermediate language course, so you're getting ready for the 300 level, which is more topic oriented and thematically oriented, and it's one component of trying to use the second language in authentic context, so we have oral communication, we have in-class responses, but in this, they're, for example, sending an email to a friend under circumstances where they would actually use Spanish, oh, okay. and so they're practicing that in a format that's not meant to be like an artificial writer report for your teacher just because yeah. the teacher says so. Right. Yeah, it sounds like you're kind of getting at a genre approach, approach based, uh, genre based approach to the study of writing. Like here's a context in which you really will be using this language and writing to that end. Okay. So the second question here I'm also very curious about is how do you currently respond to your students' writing? I mean, there's no rights, there's no wrongs. I'm just really curious about the practices that you currently employ. Uh, well, right now in the writing class, I use Google Docs, oh. and so um, I have my students group. They self-selected their own groups of partners throughout the semester that they're working with, and so they've developed an opening like diario or a journal throughout the entire semester, and they start by entering their rough drafts, and then their um, companions will come in and either highlight the comments on the side, use the different colors to add in suggestions or what have you but it allows them to work in real time and then talk to each other and then I also can go in and put my um, feedback and thoughts and, and when I've had students who've had issues and wanted to develop the writing I'll be Skyping and talking with them at the same time that we're working on the Google Doc okay. so that's really how I'm doing that right now but I'm looking for a way to sort of streamline it even sure. more sure. Yeah. And what I'll talk about later in terms of Jim, just one of the free scat, uh, screen capture programs, might be a, a good good alternative for that. I've dabbled with Google Docs a lot. I'm not, I never use it to respond to student writing, though. So it's cool that you do that. Yeah, it's really great because it has an option that you can see see the student revision history. So you'll get to see how many of the other students come in, when they come in, how long they've been on there, what were the revisions that they made and comments that they made to their peers' documents. Ah, so yeah. it's a way of monitoring but also seeing the real collaborative effort. Yeah. Exciting. Mm -hmm. Thanks. What about you? For mine, I have switched procedures just this semester is working really well. I used to have a code and I write on, on the paper um, what category sort of specifically what error was happening. Um, very detail oriented, um, discrete errors marked and this time I'm using a color coding system where I mark the category of the error so it's the student is thinking more about like okay I have a direction but I need to evaluate and then not every error is marked so it's more like minimal marking right. to get them focused on a few things rather than overwhelmed by a lot so I'm doing that in electronic format and sending them the color coding of their document along with a rubric that gives them a few discrete comments it seems to be working well Although I'm not getting as much interaction from them as in I tell them, try to figure it out, get the help you need, and then if you want to conference with me online or in person, come and I can help you work it a little bit more. But they're not coming as much as I wish they would. Yeah. And you touched on a really important issue that I always stress with my tutors, and it's sometimes tough to get faculty on board with this issue. The idea that we as instructors should be focusing on the higher order concerns, like the content of one's argument, the organization, the focus of their writing, rather than the lower order concerns, like grammar, punctuation, spelling, which in a foreign language can become a higher order concern because it actually affects comprehension. But um, it's good to know that, yeah, you're kind of focusing on the bigger aspects first, and you know, doing minimalist marking is a good way of getting at that. And third, you've already kind of touched on this a bit, but I'm just curious if you have anything else to say about shortcomings that you feel, this is what I feel like I need to be able to do better as an instructor, and I kind of maybe fled you here. Right now, just with my format, the biggest problem that I'm having is that I don't have an interface or a website that allows me to do all the things that I want to do. And the biggest feedback or the critique that I get from the students is, I don't like to have to go outside WebCT, but yet they don't like what WebCT offers. And so I'm sort of like in this rock and a hard place where I can't put everything, I can't, there's not this wonderful magic website out there that 
had, that allows me to do Skype and Google Docs and blogging and all this stuff together. I have to use bits and pieces from different spaces. So right now I'm really trying to find a kind of like virtual space that will allow me to do all of that and that would allow me to like instant, I want to talk with them immediately while they're doing the writing process uh -huh. because before they, once they're already writing it, they're already in their brain and it's harder to unlearn it than it is to learn it correctly the first time. So that more of that immediate feedback to make it more simple and simplified so they can see what it is that I'm trying to get them to do. Right. You know, I feel like when I write and put instructions up and I don't have a chance to orally uh, reinforce it, mm -hmm. then I'm learning that even though I think I'm the clearest person in the world, people are not understanding mm -hmm. what I'm writing. And so I need some way to get to them immediately, to get yeah. to more of an immediate feedback in the middle of the writing process. Oh, okay. That's what I feel. And a lot of the challenges that you're presenting, I feel like Jane should pay me for this stuff. I feel like I'm a plan for the company, but I think Jane does a really good job at this. Okay. Now, it is asynchronous, so it's okay. not like Skype in that sense, nor is it like web conferencing or Blackboard that's attached to something like uh, WebCP or Learn. But, um, you know, that's, I think, its only shortcoming. And, uh, you know, I still think. Well, just like discussion board posts that are sort of two minutes later, it's almost like they are synchronous. And I still think mm -hmm. by responding to screen capture programs really quickly, or even during the writing process, okay. it is sort of like a synchronous interaction. Okay. What I'm planning is that there's a demand for online office hours, which is great for me and oh. great for them, um, depending on scheduling and stuff like that. So physical location doesn't matter as much. But what I'm also planning is that I need to have tools at my disposal so um, if, for example, we're interacting through Skype, uh, to give an example, and we're working on writing, how can I clearly present to them, okay, where do you need to look? What am I trying to tell you this? Without being, for example, in Google Doc, where I'm correcting it for them. Right, right. So that we're interacting, it's an interactive process, we can both see that content, and I can show them exactly what I want them to focus on as a dialogue. Yeah, and again, I, I think Jane is pretty good at that, just because you're not relying on one modality. You get the audio and the visual with something like Jane, or any other screen capture program, really. And um, it's not something that you get in traditional writing, using writing to respond to writing. So it's good. Thanks for your response. So all right, I'm now just going to talk a little bit in order to kind of, I don't know, broach this topic and ground what I'm going to talk about in a minute here. Just some of the functions of writing. And this is uh, from Florian Kolmas, who uh, wrote book, The Writing Systems of the World, I think has a really nice introductory chapter about what is the purpose of writing? And he lists many more, but I've only mentioned six here that I think are really kind of relevant to responding to student writing. So first, obviously, is the interactional function, the idea that whether through emails or letters, we're communicating with a human being somewhere. It's also the mnemonic function that we all uh, are kind of indoctrinated in, and since a very young age, we're taught to use writing as a way to help remember information. So that we're trudging through really difficult, abstract territory, we're listening to a lecture as a student. How do I get my mind around this? I need to write my, my notes down. So it's the idea that if you write something down, it will therefore be remembered. And uh, social control is a really interesting one, too. And this has really come about in my dissertation work, the idea that using writing in, say, a community that has an endangered language, the idea that writing can present a kind of way of sanctioning how information gets disseminated in a community. And I would argue just more generally that's what we get with writing is that, you know, when you're just using the modality of writing, there's an aspect of social control that is introduced there. It's also an undeniable aesthetic function. It works in two ways. I mean, you have certain genres that are enjoyable to read, like poetry or novel, just kind of creative writing, or some people who just love reading technical writing. I'm not necessarily one of those people. But there's also the, uh, the beauty of writing itself, like calligraphy or the proliferation of fonts and how certain fonts, because of the way they look, kind of connote a different feel. There's also the distancing and reifying functions. And I put these in bold because I think these are really at the heart for problems that uh, are posed by using writing to respond to writing. So the distancing function is really the idea that um, you know, the reader and the writer could be separated by space and time. Someone could write an article uh, now, and then it could be read uh, a thousand years from now. They're still entering into a conversation, but uh, they may never meet each other. 
And also the reifying function has to do with the idea of permanence, that whether it's a, you know, a cuneiform inscribed on a clay tablet or an e-book, there's something about writing that says, hi, I'm permanent, I'm going to be here for a while. And so therefore it kind of takes on an authoritative quality, and like it's like an object when you're writing it down. It's kind of what's at the heart of reifying, is rendering something more concrete. So I just want to talk very briefly about some of the problems with using writing to respond to writing. And this is something that I know I've had direct experience with as an instructor in English and linguistics. First, the idea that when you're just relying on writing, the message is text dependent. We, when we're using spoken language, we have sort of paralinguistic cues like gesture, kind of a raising of the eyebrow, pitch and tone that uh, we really don't have when we're writing. So the text have, has to be self-sufficient in terms of the meaning that it's uh, aiming to get across. Or in the words of Beth Hewitt, um, writing is, well, whatever is written will be read as the message. And so I think a lot of times, I know I've done this, I think instructors do this a lot too, is they sort of unwilling, unwittingly undermine a lot of their own efforts just by using writing, which kind of ties in to my next point here, which is that as instructors, we, uh, we often come across as more authoritative than we intend, than we intend to. The idea that written comments, as opposed to oral ones, can be perceived as being more authoritative, permanent, and directive than intended. So again, just because, you know, it's, it's sort of, to me anyway, because writing is perceived as permanent, it's like, iconically then, it's authoritative. Whereas speech is just evanescent, as soon as the words leave your mouth, oh no, I can't put them back in, I'm therefore offended somebody. But with speech, you can sit down and you can erase those ideas and all that comes with it, but it's, to me, it's an icon, the idea that if it's written down, if it's going to be there for a while, it is therefore authoritative. And this is what you get from community members who talk about, I want to write my heritage language down, I want to make a dictionary of my heritage language, because then it will be a real language. The idea that uh, you know, writing just confers an official uh, status upon a language that it maybe doesn't have with spoken language. And also, misprioritization here is, I think, related to the previous point. The idea that students often ascribe the same level of importance to comments related to surface level issues, like grammar, spelling, and punctuation, with deeper level issues, like the content of one's argument, the organization of that argument, their thesis statement, the focus in their writing, that kind of thing. So, especially if you're using writing like, just on the side in a margin, awkward sentence, versus um, rework your thesis. Well, both of those comments are really brief, and they're just sort of saying there's a problem here, but it's not kind of assigning any different weight to those comments. So students kind of say, well, okay, they're probably worth the same amount of points, especially if there's no rubric that they can refer to. So just again, a lot of this happens as a result of using writing to respond to writing. And as an extension of that, as instructors, our comments can take students' attention away from their own purposes in writing and focus that attention on why we were even commenting on something. And I know when I was an undergraduate, I did just this, and Stephen Moore talks about this, and Nancy Summers as well. The idea that um, you know, when we're getting a piece of writing back from our instructor, the first thing I would do after looking at the grade is, what are the comments? And then I would only revise my piece of writing based on those comments. And this is what our students tend to do also, is they only revise where there are comments, and they therefore don't tend to engage in deep, substantive revision by looking at the document as a whole, it's sort of, well, where are the comments? I'm going to start there, and I'm going to end there. So what I think is really cool about screen capture programs is that, if you don't already know, that they basically just allow you to capture what you're doing on your monitor. It's not up here, but I think the first thing that these screen capture programs do is they really humanize you as an instructor, especially if you're teaching an online course where you may not get the opportunity to meet with students at all in a face-to-face -face setting. So as far as your students are concerned, they may view you as something as a robot. No offense, but if they never meet you, you know, you could be totally fooled into thinking, oh, this is just a robot that passed the Turing test. So. But um, by using screen capture programs and talking about a piece of writing and maybe having your dog in the background doing a distraction or something, it just humanizes you as an instructor. But also, it uh, just allows you to avoid those problems that I mentioned by using writing to respond to pieces of writing. 
I mean, there's a whole host of problems that go along with using screen capture programs, but they're mostly kind of technological, logistic sort of things. But also, these screen capture programs allow you to easily disseminate class resources. So you can send a PowerPoint presentation about, say, the difference between ER and IR verbs in Spanish or Polar and Fire. And, but, you know, PowerPoint is maybe a kind of cold and kind of distant feel to it, but if you put it into something like uh, a Jing video or any screen capture program, it then allows you to talk through the PowerPoint, which then adds another modality to the presentation. So it not only humanizes you as an instructor, but you can then use the audio and the visual when talking about a certain uh, concept in class. And therefore, you can cater to students in multiple learning styles. So I would argue that once familiar with this technology, and there's a learning curve, but I think it's pretty short for something like Jing that I'll be talking about very soon, very soon. The process is actually much faster than responding to writing in the traditional way of using writing to respond to writing. And I would add also just kind of through maybe Google Docs or anything that involves writing because you're actually just talking. So this is just an overview of some of the screen capture programs that are out there. And uh, I heard you two talking about Camtasia. It's an incredibly powerful program if, if you've never messed with it before, Cameron Leslie, but you probably have because you guys know a lot more about tech stuff than I do. It's like $300 for Windows, and then there's a scaled down version about 100 bucks for Mac. Really powerful editing software, but it's an incredibly steep learning curve, as you probably noticed. Uh, but it's available for both platforms, Mac and Windows. Snagit and Camtasia are both made by the same company, and so is Jing. I think it's all TechSmith. It's all under the TechSmith brand. Snagit is really good for screenshots, but I found that it's a pretty steep learning curve too, and you do have to pay for it. It's 50 bucks, but it's available on Mac and Windows. I, uh, I, I, I didn't really mess a whole lot with I Show You. It's a bit cheaper. It's 20 bucks. When I did mess with it, I found it to be really highly customizable. But I also found that there was a really long upload time, that when you completed a screenshot video, it took ages for just a three or four minute video to get uploaded to a site, which was a big drawback for me. And even though I'm a Mac person, I full well realized that not everybody is, and that's one of the drawbacks too, is it's just available for Mac. Cam Studio is free, but when I messed with it, it was just rather buggy, and I guess that's what you may expect from a lot of free programs, I think Jing is an exception. But Cam Studio is pretty easy to use, but it's Windows only. ScreenShop and ShowMe are both exclusively available for the iPad. ScreenShop is pretty cool, especially for kids, that's an advantage, but I think that's also its drawback. It is very clearly you know, for kids, and it's uh, the kind of interface is, I don't know, it's not very good for adults, I don't think. Show Me is a really good one though. It's a free program, you can have an unlimited session, which means in contrast to Jane, which limits you to five minutes, I actually think it's a good thing, but you could have, say, a 40 minute video, you could have an entire lecture. It's not a, a strictly speaking screen capture program, you're basically using it like a whiteboard, but you can embed YouTube videos and JPEGs and Word documents, so you can do just about all the things that a screen capture program can do, at least when I messed with it. And then Jin here is the last one, and that's kind of what I'll try to, to focus on and sell you all on. It's, uh, it's a free program, so you can download it for free. There's a pay version that's called Jin Pro, but I would encourage you not to get that. And not only because you have to pay for it, but because they're going to actually phase it out in January so that you won't get into music, so it's just not worth it to buy it for me. Um, so this could be viewed as a real drawback here, that you're limited to five-minute videos. But I, I tend to think of it as a really good thing because our students are human beings like we are, and you know, after 10, 15 minutes, our attention spans just start to trail off. And so with five minutes, I think you can accomplish a whole lot of things. And it's a brief video. I just feel like our students are more likely to watch a five-minute video than say 30 minutes. Oh my goodness, this teacher's gonna talk to me about 30 minutes, 30 minutes about this piece of writing. Oh, if there were five minutes, I, I can see them looking at that whole video. Maybe not for 30. And the cool thing about Jing is it's available for Mac and Windows. So I'm just going to play an example of what a Jing video looks like here. And then I'm actually going to, after this, model kind of from start to finish how you make a Jing video. 
to show you that it really is freakishly easy. So the first thing you'll notice here is I've uh, I just got a link. So you can um, you can save a, a Jing video in the traditional way. I think it only stays in SWF format, which is a flash format. But these videos, even if they're five minutes, they can be you know 20 megabytes basically. So that starts to really chew up space on your computer, and that's why I'm a big fan of just sending this to a Screencast's website where they can store up to I don't know I think it's maybe 20 gigs. And this is free. This is all free. I know the morning one this is really quiet too. Before I actually start the video, just to give you some context, I had one of my tutors last fall put this video together because she noticed a lot of students were coming into our writing drop-in lab and they were struggling with how to do research. And this is a very common thing that our students have to do in courses at UNM. And so it's one thing to sit there with them and walk them through re research, like here's JSTOR, here's how you navigate a, a research a database like that. But she said, well, you know, I'm also working with a lot of online writing lab submissions that get at the research process, so why don't I just send out a video to students that gives them a good breakdown of how to look for an article in its original source. And so that's what this video is about. Hello, everyone. Today I'm going to be showing you how to find the original journal article after you found what they really interesting blog post or a news review of some new research. So um, the first thing to do is to find your news article. So I'm just going to be very vague here. I'm going to type in the So there you can see they're doing whatever they're doing on the computer, and James is capturing First link, Science Daily, sounds promising. Um, one of the first things you want to do is just take a look at the website that you're getting this information from. So Science Daily doesn't necessarily look too um, scientific, however, it does have it looks like a bunch of links to a bunch of different um, new research that's going on, and that's exactly what we're looking for, so that should be fine. And then I'm just going to click the one that looks most interesting, and mouth frames turning transparent seems pretty interesting to me, so we're going to go ahead and click on that. And what you want to do initially is just read this article, kind of get, get your bearings on what, um, on what the research was about, some basic understanding of what they did to find it out. Um, but then we're going to go ahead and delve a little bit deeper to find the actual journal article. So when you're reading it, you want to pay close attention to trying to find um, the title of the journal article if you can. Unfortunately, it's not normally listed, so you might have to do some investigative work, but you should be fine. Um, and another really, really key part to find, uh, to find this journal article, is finding the journal that it was published in, along with the name or primary author. So, just by looking over this, we can kind of see right away that Nature and Neuroscience was the journal this was published in. Um, the name of the journal will commonly be underlined or italicized, so it shouldn't be too difficult to find it in, but if it's not, then it'll be something along the lines of published in. Um, and then the next step we want to do is see if we can find the title for the article. Let's go ahead and skim through here, see if we can find it. And unfortunately, like it is commonly the case, they didn't actually bother to mention what the title of the journal article was. Um, so I'm going to look at that third piece of information, which would be the lead researcher or the primary author. Now, just by reviewing this, it says, aha, here, okay, so this kind of gives you a clue, at least gives you something you can search for to hopefully find a specific article. So here it says that this new chemical uh, was developed by Atsushi Miyawaki and is seen at the Riken Brain Science Institute. So this, this, considering this is the only information as far as who actually did this research that this article provides, this is what we're going to be using to search for the actual article. So now we're going to take those two pieces of information we were able to find, the name of the journal it was published in and the name of one of the authors, 
We're going to go ahead and go to the main journal list page. We'll open up a Google search. We know that it was published in Nature in the New York Times. And then, oh, here we go. Here's the main page for Nature New York Times. And already you can kind of tell that this website looks a little bit more official than the other one, so I think we're on the right track. Also, it mentions current issues, and when it comes to journals, that's pretty relevant. Um, so with our other piece of information, how we're going to use that is we're going to search for it. So the primary author that we found is Mia, Mia Waki. And we'll go ahead and search for that and see what comes up. Now, this is, this is relatively easy to tell that this is the same journal article because, I mean, how many journal articles are being published on transparent mouth frame? But the reason you read over the, the news article before and made sure that you have a good understanding of the basics of the research was so that when you're searching for it and you can find the same abstract just shown right there, you can just make sure that it's the same research. And you can also see here this Milwaukee fellow is one of the authors, so it looks like we're on the right track. Now, the next step is actually seeing if there's a link to the document itself. And if we look around here, sure enough, it says download PDF. So I'll go ahead and click that, and hopefully it'll work. And there we go. So um, that's pretty much all there is to it. Like I said, you find your news article, and then you try to find the title of the journal, the title of the research article itself, and one of the main authors. Um, if you can't find the journal, Titles and don't fret too much. You can always search for the specific author and the journal that it was in. And hopefully, just like this, we should be able to find it. All right, thank you so much. So, when this tutor, Casey, did this, I really miss her because she was an outstanding tutor and she really was proactive in making Jing videos. When she did this, I, I remember her doing this like four or five times. She was like, ah, oh, it's longer than five minutes and I didn't get it all out. I have to do this again. So it just it takes a little practice to get used to the fact that there is a five minute time limit. But once you get used to that and uh, you get used to it pretty quickly, then you just kind of get in the habit of uh, keeping things within that time frame. So okay, what I'm going to do now is just walk you through the process of making a Jing video, and I just want to try to sell you on how easy this is. This is Jing, and it's installed. And all you really do to to find the program is just Google it and type in J I N G as the name of it. And uh, it'll bring you to TextMint's website. That's the corporation that makes Camtasia, Snagit, and Jing. And then you download it, and once you install it, then you have the option of keeping this little sun on your uh, desktop. And I, I've done that just you know, for the ease of opening it up here. So once you get there, then you hover your mouse over it there. And you can see there's a few options here. It's really small on the screen up there, sorry. But one option here is kind of the settings. And this is history videos that you've already made and this is where you actually capture the screen and we'll get there in a second the first thing I always start with is I go to settings and there's some things to notice here like here's kind of exit Jing and we don't want to do that so there's some help we'll bring you to a web page a text web page and preferences is where I always like to go first so I put preferences and then what I do is I, I take my, my headset and this is just a headset that I like using because uh, it's a USB headset. So there's a lot of headsets on the market out there that'll work just fine, but I tend to find that this is kind of the best bang for the buck. I forget what it's called. It's uh, just a Logitech one, but you know, it's, it's a pretty comfortable headset and it's USB. And I think that's key because USB is, for me, much more successful for Jing to just automatically detect. Oh, you're now plugging in a headset. I get it. So most of the time, you don't even have to mess with preferences. I just do it because I'm sort of obsessive compulsive and want to make sure that things are going to work properly. So, if you plug it in here. Do you have to have a headset or you can just record from the microphone on your computer? You can do that too. The problem with that is you catch a lot of outside noise. And so that's why I think this headset is pretty good as it cuts out a lot of that outside uh, just noise. So, what you do here is uh, you go to select device and it's just to make sure. And that's already a great sign. So the green bar is turning red. So it's obviously registering that there is a, a microphone plugged in. So you just make sure that that's selected. You push OK. I didn't even have to go in there to do that. Like I said, the USBs are always kind of automatically detected by the machine, as long as it's a newer machine. And then uh, let's go to finish here. So this is the point where you actually select the screen. So you, you select the crosshairs here. So I just kind of put my headset on and get ready. But 
you see here, you're, you're just moving your mouse around to select what you want to include on the screen. So for instance, I just like to start in the upper left-hand corner, and it's really just clicking and dragging. And then I don't usually include the toolbar at the bottom, so I just kind of get everything else in there. And once you let go, then you see this pop up down here, and there's a few options down here. So cancel, like, oh, I didn't mean to capture this picture. I wanted to capture a smaller part of my desktop. Then you could try it again. I should never mess with review selection. I'm not sure what that does. And here's, a, well, you could capture an image. Like, I just want to take a, uh, a screen capture photo of my desktop. And you can do that. But what I think is really the purpose of Jing is to use video. So that's what I'm going to do now. And I'm just going to kind of improvise here and just model. I'm not going to be talking about anything in particular. But once you push this button, you'll notice it starts counting down. The mic is on. And uh-oh, so now I'm talking. And now you can see the one, two, three down here. And I'm moving my mouse around, and there's people looking at me funny, and I'm talking, and there's a headset on my head, and this is really strange. I'm not really talking about anything in particular, but everything that I'm doing here with my mouse is being recorded. So if I wanted to open up a web page, okay, now I'm at the Capstone page. Or no, I don't want to do that. I think I'm going to go to the UNM homepage. So here you can already see the audio visual component here. You're seeing the web page as it is on uh, my computer, but you're also hearing me speaking to you all. So all right, let's say that you're happy with that video and you actually did something informative. Um, you could cancel that, like, oh, that was terrible. You know, I, I really didn't mean to say that. Let's start over. Then you push cancel or restart. Like, I, I like the way it's set up. I like the, the screen that it's capturing right now, but I still messed up on the audio. Let me just restart. But I'm not going to do that. Or you could put a mute. You could mute your voice. Or you could pause, like, oh, I need to go get a book real quick. And then you could resume recording, which is a really nice feature. But this is the one I'm going to click. Finish. So once you click finish, then you get a video itself. And this is always a good thing to do is to just play it to make sure, hmm, let's see what this would sound like from a student's perspective. Whoa. Three down here, and I'm moving my mouse around. They're looking at me funny, and I'm talking, and there's a headset on my head. This is really strange. I'm not really talking about anything in particular, but everything that I'm doing here with my mouse is being recorded. So if I wanted to open up a web page, okay, now I'm at the cat's web page. All right, now I don't want to do that. I think I'm going to go to the UN. There we go. So I'm just muting that. But let's say you're uh, you're happy with that. So don't push cancel, because then you're going to have to start it all over again. And I never push save either. This is kind of counterintuitive and one of the weird things about Jing. But you might be thinking, uh, well, of course I want to save it. But I never do, because if you push save, then you're actually saving uh, an SWF file on your computer. And I don't know, I just don't tend to do that, because I do this other option, which is share via screencast.com. I forget how much space they give you on a free account, but it's something like I, don't know, I think it's 10 or 20 gigabytes, which is a lot of space and a lot of videos that you can produce. So I just like having it out there on the cloud rather than on my machine, which can and will crash at some point, fail, whatever. So once you're ready and happy with your video, then you push that share by a screencast, and you can see it uploading here. So that was a pretty short video. I mean, that was, what, 45 seconds, maybe a minute. And it's six megabytes. So if you're doing five minutes, these can really get big. And that's why, again, I'm just in favor of saving this on the cloud. I'll move that aside. So just uh, watch this upload real quick. Any questions you all have at this point? Have you used up your space on the cloud? And if you were to do that, what would be your options? The other option, I think, is just create a new account. Because it's totally free, I would just say, I don't know, use a different email address or, you know, Jing1 at uh, gmail.com. Jing2, but uh, I've been using this for about a year now and made oh, about 20 or 30 videos. And some of them are close to five minutes and have not exceeded that. So, okay, we're almost done uploading here. And uh, once it does upload, then you get this link, you on screencast.com. Always click that link because this is the really good information here. This is the URL that you then copy 
and paste in a, an email in a discussion board online on WebCT. So there may be a way to embed this actual video, like you can embed YouTube videos in some discussion boards. I'm just not a whiz with HTML or coding. That's what's required to do that. So I'm kind of old school in the sense that I just copy the URL and then I just paste it. But you know, you can test that, and I always do by copying the URL. And then I just open up a browser and let's see if it actually brings me to that video. And it does. And then you can play it and you can hear me again. But I hate I hate myself my whole but that's really all there is to it, so I think it's pretty darn easy to use. Yeah. So if you were going to use that link again, like in another presentation for students or whatever, how do you go into your cloud and find which video that is? Like, say you've got like a bunch of videos. Sure. Yeah. Let me show you. So you uh, let's get out of this. Go to this is where you go to history, and then you open up history, and because this is. The first time I've um, put this on this computer, it's only going to have what I've made on this computer. So that's something to be aware of. Like if you're using different machines, it's only going to keep the videos that you've used on this machine, even if you're not saving to this machine. So you actually have to go to the uh, TechSmith website and then log in with your particular login information. Then you can view the complete history there. Can you rename those files? You absolutely can. I, I never do that, but you can, and I think you might be able to just, uh, no? Maybe you can't rename it then. Yeah, you know, there may be some cases where it's really useful to name the video, like if you're, well, just emailing it to a class, but I always kind of include the title in the body of the email message or in the message board post if you're putting it on the discussion board. So I guess for me, I, I never title them. And I'm thinking maybe you can't do that. So there's little things that I think Jing Pro could give you, like maybe that ability or an unlimited uh, video capability. You could make a 50 minute video if you wanted. But that's going to be phased out in January and you have to pay for it. So I would really encourage you not to do that. Are they planning on transitioning to another program or another thing after the year? I'm not sure. I, I don't think so, actually. I've been looking at their website. It just says we're phasing Jing Pro out in January. It doesn't say anything that, uh, like here's what we're going to do to replace them. I think they're just, their market is such that either you use Jing free or you use a really powerful high end program like Camtasia for Snag. So do you have to have an account sign up with Green Pass prior to being able to do that? Well, once you download the program and you open it for the first time, then you're prompted to sign up. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no limit. You know, you can sign up for 50 accounts and then you have 50 times whatever 20 gigabytes of space. But that's how you want to do it. So that's, um, that's really all there is to it. So it's incredibly simple, but like I said, very robust program. And I just think it's a really new technology. Not a lot of instructors are using this. Maybe someone somewhere on this campus is, but it's just a lot of potential. And I really feel like using Jing is not just using technology for technology's sake. There's a lot of pedagogical advantages to using screen capture programs like Jing that have this multimodality component built into it to respond to student writing. So um, I don't know, I feel like in a way we're kind of getting in on the ground floor if we do this stuff now with our students because there's going to be just more multimodal projects anyway in the interest of digital literacy, responding to things like this. I don't know, I just feel like there's going to be more of this happening. Mm -hmm. I know they use Jing um, really commonly in K-12, oh. um, especially well, um, in a Florida virtual school where it's a fully online school district essentially they all use Jing in their courses all the time it's just everyone yeah uses it. and it's a great thing if you also have a web ct course or web enhanced course to add materials that way too yeah yeah and this is really what i encourage my online tutors to do uh, I'm not requiring them yet i'm going to kind of scale it in so eventually say next fall i will require them to, uh, to respond to a certain number of online writing lab submissions by using Jing. Because I want my tutors to get used to using this because with the rapid increase in online course offerings, you're just gonna see, I think, a real genuine need for, for this kind of technology. You know, I wanna get our tutors ready for that. Uh, yes, in an yeah. online class, it's particularly valuable. Yeah, do you have any thoughts on how students could use this? 
Yeah, now, for instance, the peer review process, which is, you know, I remember as an undergraduate taking English 101 and 102, uh, and they still do this now, and it's a really valuable part of the writing process, is getting students to provide feedback to other students in that class about their writing. But that very often takes the same shape as instructors writing. Like, I'm just going to write in your paper, and it's very often about grammar and stuff, and here you go, sort of thing. So it's, it was really uh, the bane of my existence as a freshman taking first year composition courses to do peer review because it's, I don't know, it just seemed really boring and traditional to me. This is something that students could use where rather than using writing to respond to their peers' writing, they actually make a Jane video. And so it's a multimodal project and they're just kind of enhancing digital literacy by making such a video in the first place. And like I said, they're avoiding a lot of the problems associated with using writing to respond to writing. So you're accomplishing a lot of things by making a video. I mean, yeah, if you're doing peer review, that's the focus of the assignment. But just by using this program, I think they're getting a lot of skills necessary for you know a professional life. Computers, technology, just on the up, on the up and up. Any other questions? Yeah, I have kind of a specific question. Is it like if you envision, for example, myself? Um, talking to a student, let's say by Skype, I'm in an online office hour, and we're working on an essay. Like, do you have any advice on, like, at what point to do a screen capture and send it to the student how long that would take? Um, for example, we're interacting on paragraph one. And what's the most efficient way for me to give them real-time feedback on, okay, this is where you need to look, this is like what I see right here, so that it's kind of a dialogue. Sure. Yeah, that's a tricky question. A lot of this, because every interaction like that is, a, is unique as a fingerprint. I think it depends on how long the assignment is, and how complex the assignment is. Maybe instead of one video, say, at the end of the writing process, which is what I would naturally do, kind of just, okay, here's the draft that you submitted, now I'm going to comment on that draft. But if it's a 10 or 20 page paper, like we you know, ask our students to do in other level coursework, it might require multiple gym videos. So then you could respond after, say, um, an introduction or after, uh, here's your thesis, here's a thesis statement kind of video for five minutes, here's an organization video, but you have to make multiple videos in it. That's kind of one of the drawbacks of Jane, but I don't have a really firmly entrenched view about that. I think that this technology is just so new. We know that there's pedagogical advantages to it, but I don't think there's one more way to do that. It really depends on what you feel as an instructor. Okay, given the complexity of this assignment and what students are likely to struggle with, I think I'm going to respond here at this point in the paper. So you could break it up by stages too. I mean, I think of the writing process as consisting of three stages. You have pre-writing, you have the drafting, and then you have revision. So if you wanted to make three videos to get at that, first about pre-writing, you know, here's some ideas that I can talk to you about to help you generate ideas in writing this paper. And then maybe once they've submitted a draft, let me comment on that draft, give you ideas for revision. And then once they revise that draft, there's another video. There's there's endless possibilities. I don't really have a, a strong opinion one way or another. Do you know of any um, real time screen capture tools that's like this that, but, that would be real time? The only thing I can think of is in WebCT or Learn, they use Blackboard Collaborate, mm -hmm. I think, which is a web conferencing program. Mm -hmm. So it's not in the strictest sense a, a screen capture program. It's based on a whiteboard. But you can say embed a YouTube video, and I think therefore you could embed a Jing video. If you've got the URL, it seems to me that's all you need. But you can also um, that student can give you permission to use their screen, and you can you know you can go in and, and show them on their computer screen what they're doing. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. Maybe I kind of uh, didn't answer your question because I brushed over that idea, but. That's a really common thing to do is you say, okay, send me your paper, whatever stage you're at, in the Microsoft doc. Then you open it up, start the gym, and you capture that document. So then you're looking at the paper, but you're talking through your feedback. Here's why I'm commenting on this piece of writing in the way that I am. And that's something that, uh, you know, through traditional writing, students don't get. They just get your comments and they don't get the context behind it. So um, I think as long as you're doing that, that's pretty powerful. But it is asynchronous can't do it in real time. If you wanted to do it in real time, I can't think of any screen capture programs that are real time. When you have Skype, but Skype's like a webcam, and then you kind of have to show the computer webcam thing, and then you get the weird recursive mirror effect maybe, so I don't know. 
But I think uh, Blackboard Collaborate, which is used currently on Learn, WebCT uses a different one. I think it's called Illuminate. Yeah, their address is pretty much the same. Yeah, they're very similar. But they're both incredibly powerful whiteboard programs, and I think you can do a lot with that. So maybe a combination of, say, Jing and Blackboard Collaborate or Illuminate with any web conferencing program. Skype also allows you to share your screen. Oh, okay. so you can. I never Skype, so I have to. Yeah, you can, when you go into it, you click on it and it'll say share screen, and you can share your whole desktop with the person that you're Skyping with. Okay. And so it'll have their picture that they see you and then them, and then your whole screen, and you can navigate your whole thing and share with them everything. So I you're actually showing. studied up on that before I so. did this presentation. That's a great advantage for something like uh, for Skype. But I guess another thing that Jane might be really good at is that. Um, you know, Skype is unavoidably synchronous, mm -hmm. so you don't have a whole lot of time to say. And you can't care. record it either. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, that, I guess that's true. That's true. But I think it would be for more like a one-on-one -on -one kind of a thing, but the Jing, if you, like for example, if I were to do a, 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 an interview with like one of my students and do that and then record it through Jing at the same time I'm doing that, right. then post that, then it's a model for all the other students exactly. and they come back to it and can see what's going on. So exactly. I think that's the advantage of Jing is that they can go in and replay it and replay it like and watch it over and over and over again. I absolutely agree. I mean, if you're noticing consistent problems among some aspect of learning Spanish or right. whatever. Okay, I've noticed that this is something we're all struggling with as a class. We make a Jing video about it. Yeah. And there's just a lot of things that you can accomplish in five minutes, believe it or not. And uh, like I said, I think it's a good weather because oh, I'm not going to watch a 50 minute video about the difference between for and para, as exhausted as it might be. I want something quick in five minutes that, even if it isn't exhausted, it gives me something to stand on. Yeah. And I think that's kind of a good one to have in a free program. Too, so. so you can use Jing to record a Skype conversation. I would have to imagine because if you, open up, if you yeah. open up your Skype and you hit share screen and now you're sharing your screen with them, I imagine yeah. you have the same program running right. five minutes, you could be able to record your whole conversation with your students, sharing them the screen, showing them what they want to do, then post that as a model. Because I'm thinking about next semester from all the things that went not the way I would have wanted done them to this semester. So for next semester, post that at the beginning and be like, this is what I want each of you to do by the first week of class. Meet with me, we're gonna go over this, this, this to get that individual touch. Yeah. And yeah. then they can all watch that video over and over again, so. Yeah, it doesn't matter yeah. what is going on in your computer. You could have 50 programs running. That's the only problem here is right. like your broadband access may not, it might be yeah. a little bit buggy or you just have a slow machine sort of thing. Yeah. That's the only problem here. It doesn't matter what program is open, Jing can capture it. That's cool. I really sound like I'm talking on behalf of Jing and I just want to make that, I'm not a plant, I'm not representing this corporation, <laughs> but. We don't think, believe you. Okay, I don't. <laughs> Oh, you found me out. No, it's, uh, I don't know. I just think it's the best screen capture program out there for what it can do and its price. Which for free. Is free. Yeah. I'm a big fan of free, and if it can be as robust as it is, then it's great. Yeah, then any faculty or any student can use it. Yeah. On any machine. Right. Now, I should also mention that with uh, you know New Media and Extended Learning, if you're teaching an online course, all the requests have to go through New Media and Extended Learning, and they also then require you that if you're going to do web conferencing, they want you to use Blackboard Collaborate or Illuminate or you know one of the things that they've officially sanctioned. So I don't know. I feel maybe you could get into hot water with uh, with them or the university by using. I like think that. I don't know. It's just something to be aware of. Well, when I talked to my web designer for the class, his point is not that you can't use other stuff. Yeah. It's that they can't offer the tech support right. for it. Right. So if you want to use all these other bells yeah. and whistles, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. But you have to be the one who, when your students call and they're like, "I don't know what I'm doing," you got to be the one who's going to tell yes. them how to fix it. That makes so sense. you know they're not going to offer tech support for something that that they right. don't know about. But it's nice that you don't have to log in to WebCT to be able to have that, you know, conversation. Or I mean, I agree, but the big uh, critique I'm getting from a lot of my students is they want it all in one space. So it's either I use, you know, I'm using parts of WebCT and other stuff out it, and then they feel like, oh, I'm going to like five, six different things. So you, that can, I you can just upload your game videos 
yeah. UFTT. Exactly. And then they're right there. And then that way it'll yeah. give them like a clear understanding of all the other pieces that I want to use. So right. I think it's very helpful. Yeah, because all you have to do is just follow the web link if you got a functional web browser yeah. and you got speakers and you can hear it. And there you see go. It. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. But yeah, it's really cool. I like the recursive quality that it has. I can have a, a PowerPoint open, but I can capture that PowerPoint. I can be doing Skype, but I can mm -hmm. capture that Skype mm -hmm. with Jing. So yeah, it's a really robust program. Any other questions? I'm really kind of early on time here. But it's certainly not, uh, yeah, it's not even close to 1.30. But that's really all I have to say. And maybe because I've ended early, that's uh, just how simple the program is. Uh, you know, really short learning curve. This is not Camtasia. You're not going to have to spend a lot of time with a manual. You saw the program. It's just there's three options there. You have preferences, history, and screen capture, <laughs> and that's it. So there's not a whole lot of places to get lost. Well, otherwise, um, thanks. Thanks for allowing me to, to do this talk again. And uh, I like when with small groups. It's nice and more people. Great, but I like smaller groups because then I can tailor my presentation more specifically to you all. Well, thank you so much, Evan, for coming and yeah. giving this presentation. I learned a lot, good. and I got a lot of good ideas for you guys to see. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I'm learning just as much. Like I tell my tutors, when you're tutoring, you're going to learn from your students as well. They don't believe me, and it's the same thing with presentations like this. So, got a lot of really positive feedback from you all. And I have a question that's yeah. not really related to this. Yeah. But um, do you know of any really effective online tools for peer editing, peer editing, how to guide the peer editing process? Um, places that you can go that will explain how to like sort of set up collaborative groups to do it in the online space. One that I'm thinking of was told to me by uh, Gary Allen Smith, who works in the geology department. It's called Calibrated Peer Review. Have you heard that? Okay. I have been to that. I it's, haven't messed with it. Uh -huh. have, have you, what, have you I've looked at it, but what it is is you have to design. It's a, it's a lot more work and you have to, it's designing this this long like an, a questionnaire and you get your students to fill out the questionnaire oh, okay. and it sort of teaches them as they go through it, what is the real meaning of peer editing? Yeah. And I definitely feel like it's it's worth the time, but it's- But that's not what you're thinking of. Uh, yeah, no, that's a great tool, but I'm, what I'm, I don't know, I guess I was looking for maybe tips or a space or a virtual space that maybe made it more succinct because I looked at this website but it's not really like a student's going to look at it and be like whoa what is this I'm not going into this do you know what I mean it's more yeah. like they're not going to it's more how to design it for the instructor's perspective but I'm looking at maybe a website or a space where a student can go and look at that website and it really talks about like the peer review the peer editing process the value in it um effective ways to do it I mean whether it's in English or Spanish but um Okay, maybe the Purdue Online Writing Lab has something on it. I don't okay. know, though. Yeah. Okay. Well, that yeah. That's a tricky one. I feel yeah. like we should have a page at CAPS on our website uh -huh. that talks about that. So just an idea we can put that on our website. Something about, hey, students, here's how to do peer review kind of thing. Right. So, yeah, yeah I really can't think of anything to refer you to, incredibly. That's okay, because I know that, like, from my own experience, it's much more involved than, like, I'm trying to get to a higher point. And um, it's just coming back like your comments are great. I love your paragraph. Right. Uh, you know that's really cool conclusion. And I'm like, dude, that's not what. The, and I did a whole, and, you know, these are the questions that she guided and and this, but they're not. And so I don't know if maybe they need sort of like an introductory, like a tutorial video that like maybe and I can do that with Jane. Like, here's what I expect in a peer review. Mm -hmm. Maybe something like right. that. Yeah, really the helpful in Jane. Show them the examples. That. Like show them examples that are of good examples and bad examples and on a right. team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that I'm just like talking to point out why that might be a good or why. Yeah, that's I guess another thing that Jing can do is you get a couple models of here's a really great example of peer review. Right. See how the student has commented on this aspect of the writing right. process. And here's a really poor example. Right. Uh, they're just commenting on great grammar or uh, whoops, missed a comma sort of thing. Yeah. So yeah, I can't think of any websites though, and I know they must be out there, but maybe a clever Google search could yield something for yeah. them. But yeah. okay. there's got to be something. Out I there. looked and I found some stuff. I was just wondering if you knew of anything more like I'm embarrassed to say that I don't know. about that because I, I feel like that whole like when people hear peer review, they get so like bogged down. They're like, "This is horrible. I don't want to do this," and that's when I'm getting this real like pushback with my students. And I want to know: is there more? 
fun format where it can present it and be like, here's all the great, wonderful things that you're going to get out of peer review. Look at all the pluses you get before you get your paper torn apart by a professor or whatever. You know, like the Texas A and M University um, Writing Center has a YouTube channel. Okay. And they may or may not have a video there about the peer review. They process. yeah, I've seen that. They have a they have a Portuguese show that they do. Oh, okay. okay, yeah. Maybe look there, but otherwise there's okay. gotta be something online. I just I'd be curious to know too. Yeah. I mean I've done some searches and I found like little PowerPoints and little like quick steps and like here's questions that guide it, but I was wondering if there was a more all overall encompassing like a space that like really talks about this is our mission statement, this is what we believe is peer review, peer editing, here's the process. Here's what are the positive, positive, positives and minuses. I don't know. So yeah. I just wonder, but I thought they fail. If you find anything, yeah, yeah, I definitely will because I think that's yeah. I didn't uh, put it up here, but yeah, here's my contact information. Yeah, so uh, you know, if you have any feedback or if you just want to sit over coffee and talk about these ideas, I'm yeah. always welcome to do so. That's my office number there, 277-4499. Okay. Um, if I'm not in my office and I'm in a meeting, but most of the time I'm on my campus, I'm in my office and that's my email. Okay. 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 So I welcome any feedback on this presentation, any tool that you find, like, hey, this could be really cool to talk right. about. This okay. is a really good website that captures the, the pedagogy of doing uh, peer reviews. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and I would love if you guys find other things and if you start using these things, um, it would be great to have maybe a, a follow up kind of workshop for to have other TAs and instructors come in and and see if, you know what you've been doing because I think they all would like that. I have a question for you. Would it be possible to have the Jinx software in one or all of the labs? Like if I brought my students in to do a project in class where it's an assignment where they're using MIG, for example, mm -hmm. would they be able to do it in the, in the, in the labs here? Yeah, I don't see why not. That's, yeah, that's, okay. that's what I was thinking when you were talking about it. We have to, we have to put this <laughs> yeah. on, on the desktop. That would be awesome. Because we ha do have Camtasia, and I love yeah. Camtasia, but it's expensive. There's no yeah. way to put it on every computer, and it is, it's, it's not as easy to put right. it's, it's more powerful, but you, this is good. You don't really, you, this is really all you really need. Yeah, that's kind of how I think about it. Yeah. This is pretty darn sufficient for a program that you know, accomplishes all the goals that I have. For so yeah, we should do that. If you want to bring the class in to do that, if it's soon, let us know so that we can get that done. I'm thinking, um, I just kind of have an assignment in mind that might be kind of neat for them to do that would be beneficial, and I'd like to see how they interact with it. My other question for you is, are the students currently able to Skype from any of the labs from here? Yeah. Which one would that be? Any of them. So they can just request a headset and then yeah. just log in and yeah. they're, they're good to go. Yeah. And we can also do group Skype sessions too if for any reason you want to do that. Okay. That's great. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful remodel. Every time I come back, there's like something really good here. So this is great. <laughs> I'm just trying to see what you can Okay. Thanks, everybody.